So it doesn't necessarily follow that there'll be cigarette butts accumulating there. Uh, I detest cigarette butts or any kind of litter, and I think that speaks poorly of people who engage in that activity. Uh, we need to encourage people not to engage in that activity. But, I, you know, I'm not real passionate one way or the other. I just want developers to have incentives to come in and build what we're envisioning. And if they can't make any money doing that, then, you know, that's going to be difficult to even get it built. And it seems like the more space or the, the, the less the regulatory environment there, the less restrictive those regulations are, the more likely we're going to have people come in and build. And I like that aspect of it. Okay. Sarah. Well, my proposal would actually allow more a larger building footprint, so it would increase the building buildable area on each lot. Um, as far as the transformation of retail, it is true that we are seeing a huge shift of retailing to online because the reality is that people don't enjoy getting in cars, fighting traffic, and going to big box stores. But what is succeeding is experiential retail. And the idea that you're not necessarily going to look for a specific product, but you're going out to enjoy day shopping. And you want to take your mother out to brunch and then go to, uh, you know, stop in and try on things. Um, because as good as um, online retailing is for uh, standard size products, they still have not mastered uh, clothing um, and fit for people. So experiential retail and providing a superbly walkable environment for retail is absolutely critical to keeping that industry alive in our community. Um, and I forget what the third thing was that I was going to address, but um, it, it does increase the buildable area. Oh, the cigarette butts. And I'm just telling you what we saw on the walking tour yesterday, and I wish you had been able to attend. Thank you. Okay. Don. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I love hearing this debate, particularly from two of our ur um, new urbanists on the council, because it really gives, uh, I think, a good context of people who really agree about the environment we want to create and different ways to do it. I just wanted to share one thing that the staff participated in, in the ULI Healthy Corridor uh, sessions. We actually also had to walk, and, and there was a lot of feedback and discussion during that um, educational opportunity from people and how they felt in various parts of College Avenue. When we were walking north to, towards Evelyn Hills with no sidewalk uh, on what would have been like a cow path, um, how unsafe it felt, how safe the east side of the street newly constructed felt until we got down to, um, is it Trenton there at the bottom, uh, where the road is much more, where we lost the tree barrier and some green space barrier uh, because the right-of-way was compressed at the time that that building went in, uh, the council waived the requirement of the right-of-way dedication at that time. And so that, um, while that is a built-to zone, I would say that the overwhelming majority of the people that were at that session talked about not feeling safe walking on it. And that's really where the staff, I think, took the initial position of that, that 10 feet is good. There could, you know, 25 could be too large. That's why I love hearing this debate, um, because I think we could all point to examples where, you know, 25 might be too large and zero can be way too close. Um, and so, d depending on where you are on the street and what the interaction is. Uh, I said this last time, I'm just going to say it again, because I think sometimes we forget that we're making decisions that if we see bad consequences, we can change. This isn't a 500-year decision that can never be looked at. And we would encourage you to, um, if you're going to look at it, amending it, maybe look for a compromise between these two, you know, at 10 to 15 if 25 is too far. But, but going to zero, when you look at this entire area, um, I want you to know that in the healthy corridor study, there are sections of the street where that just simply doesn't work um, and feels safe in creating the environment that you want to build. I think as staff, having heard that from the public, it was important for us to make sure you we share that with you. But know, thank you, too, for the debate, because I love hearing that. Yeah, I, I, and I do, too. And, and I would like to oh, mark you. You're up. Well, I was going to add to this. I wanted to hear this debate because I did have the opportunity to attend a new urbanism 
conference in New Orleans where they're rebuilding, and of course they have <coughs> this issue to build to the setbacks, especially as they're looking at redevelopment and trying to integrate the uh, historical and the and rebuilding how they're looking at things. And this is exactly what we looked at when we were on our walking tour in different areas of New Orleans. Uh, and I wanted to have this discussion so, so we could visualize it directly with College Avenue. If you're familiar with New Orleans, a lot of the uh, activity for the residential areas are in the front yards, not the backyards, because of the setbacks, even in some of the larger buildings. And there's also a very vibrant uh, uh, commercial, there's still vibrant commercial areas that do have some setbacks that are around a pedestrian, a wider pedestrian area. But then, of course, as you get down to the center of the old city, everything is zero lot line. So I wanted to hear this discussion, and I'm thinking about it since I do live in this neighborhood and I've, I was raised here. And I, uh, I do think about the safety when you walk up and down College Avenue. And I also don't want to develop a tunnel uh, in some of the areas along uh, College Avenue. So I probably, even though I seconded this because I wanted the discussion, and I think that we will have to probably revisit this as we start looking at development, I most likely, Sarah, will not support this. But I wanted the discussion, and I hope that people will visualize this and take the opportunity also to walk up and down College Avenue because we can always come back and revisit this if there is a, uh, a moment of um, inspiration that someone has some good idea or we can amend it. But this is exactly the, the conversation that I was hoping that we would hear. I'm putting a kind of my walking tour experience in New Orleans along with some of the exceptional speakers that we heard throughout the nation where this uh, development of walkability, connectivity, uh, pedestrian activity uh, is certainly the topic of conversation and redevelopment for higher density downtown areas. So thank you to Matthew and Sarah for bringing the points up and uh, I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Yes, I, I think this has really been a, a really good discussion because, you know, my experience with um, the sidewalk next to the street has been Razorback Road, which I know they moved, they traveled on that road pretty quick, but <laughs> that was always, that's one of the reasons when we did the other you sex. Walk through here once. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you know, you can, you can feel the cars just brush by you as you're walking down that sidewalk. On the old sidewalk, or when they put the new apartments in, they put just a little bit of green space in there. And I can't tell you the difference on how much safer you feel having a little bit of space between you and that highway. And College Avenue is a very <coughs> highly trafficked area, and even though we've got a wider sidewalk there, it's, you know, I guess my experience on Razorback Road may be a little more edgy even walking down the wider sidewalk. So, I mean, and I, I understand the uh, zero to 10 foot lot line. I agree with you on the, uh, on the uh, retail. I think, I think that's a really good point on the retail. I just have a, I like to see a little more space on there than just a zero lot line on that major thoroughfare. It's really what, um, I know you're going to 10 feet. I just don't know how comfortable I would feel on that either. That would be, so that's just sort of my two cents. I'm not really weighing and I just, uh, well, I am waiting, and I guess I would prefer a little more space there than a zero lot line. Maybe that'll work. I just have, I'm just a little bit, just my experiences on Razorback Road walking that, it maybe <coughs> a little more edgy walking out along the highway, cars going by. Anyway, any other discussion on this? All right. If there's not, we're going to vote on the amendment, right? Uh, Sandra, would you please call the roll? Eddie? No. Bennett? No. Kurt? No. McCreary? No. Smith? No. Ray? No. Mark? Yes. Gibbs? No. Okay. 
Now we're back to the ordinance itself. Okay. We are on the third reading if you wish to go there. I mean, we need a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. All right. Or, uh, the clerk says we're actually on the third reading we, right now. Okay, good. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand her. We need okay. a motion. I want to be sure I was tracking right on this. Adele. I move we suspend the rules and go to the third and final reading. Mark. I'll second that. All right. Oops, I hit that. Yeah. Are we good? Okay. Tommy, would you please call the roll? Teddy. Yes. Kenneth. Yes. 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 Rapier. Yes. Smith. Yes. Gray. Yes. Mark. Yes. Simmons. Yes. An, ordin an ordinance to amend section 166.21 downtown design overlay district by amending the applicability section to include College Avenue overlay district and to enact section 166.26 College Avenue overlay district. Okay. Any final comments from the council? All right. Sonny, would you please call the roll? Teddy? Yes. Kenneth? Yes. Gray? Yes. Rapier? Yes. Smith? Yes. Gray? Yes. Mark? No. Kenneth? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Now we go back to number one, correct? I'm going That's to read correct. That. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> An ordinance to rezone all parcels within or near College Avenue is shown in Exhibit C of the Planning Department's agenda memo comprising about 24.62 acres and uh, we are on the we you know we've gone through the second reading we would need a motion a second to go to the third and final reading is that correct Sandra yes. that's what I have on my notes anyway mm -hmm. and so not that I know I think we moved the amendment stuff to the second one if I got all that straight that's what I now think. we're back to the first one after we've amended the second one. So this is the actual rezone. Yes, this is the actual rezone. John. Mr. Mayor, I move we go ahead and pass it. Well, we need to go to the third and All third. right, I move that we suspend the rules and go to the third and final reading. All right, we have a second. Mark. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to go to the third and final reading. Tommy, would you please call the roll? Teddy? Yes. Kenneth? Yes. Hutch? Yes. Mature? Yes. Smith? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? No. Kenyon? Yes. An ordinance to rezone all parcels within or near College Avenue was shown on Exhibit C of the Planning Department's agenda memo comprising about 24.62 acres. Okay. Any final comments from the council? Matthew? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, this has been a long process, obviously, and something that's been talked about for more than a decade, more, more informally. So I think tonight is almost a historic occasion for people that have cared about college or have ever seen that old picture of college with the trees and the dirt road and, and, and reminisce for, for something like that. Um, the, I think the amendments we made tonight were really important. So certainly it made me a lot more comfortable with, with the program, and I wanted to take just a second to talk about what might happen up the rest of college. The rest of the street is just as important, if not more more important than this part of the road. Um, I think we're dealing with this first because it's close to the downtown and we've made a multi-million dollar investment in the infrastructure. So there's a lot of justification in us taking on a, uh, a back rezoning like this. Um, from a development perspective, though, it's clear that the remainder of college, as you move farther north, is... Uh, more ripe for development than this part, um, primarily due to parcel size and topography and hydrology. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff in the floodplain here. There's a lot of stuff that is uh, on the side of a hill or at the top of the hill or at the bottom of the hill or parcels of all three um, characteristics that make developing these, especially on small parcels where you don't have a lot of room to work with and you have to play the game of inches to fit things on the site. Uh, it, it makes development very difficult. So, so part of my comment, I think, is about managing expectations about what this change means for us. I, I don't think that we're going to see uh, uh, a lot of development starts uh, arising from, from this action uh, at the level that we're hoping for. Um, the vision that we've cast for what the street's going to be is going to require us to do more with the road. Uh, 
If you've ever walked the road, or if you make a point after this to go walk, walk the road, you'll notice that just the sound of the air as cars move through it is louder than you talk. Um, so for, just from an experiential perspective, what it means to be a human on the street, uh, we aren't able to do and participate in the kinds of activities that we're talking about um, because the street itself does, does not support it. So we've still got more work to do. I don't, I don't think anybody should think that, that we're done um, with this. It's just one step of many. And, and so, so that was my first point is to manage some expectations. But the second point is I think we need to keep doing this and be aggressive about moving this kind of program farther up the street. Um, we've probably got most of the techniques and mechanisms and, and, and tools that, that we need to do that, but maybe not all of them. Maybe we need some new ones. Um, I'm hopeful we can, we can figure that out in the next year. Um, and I think that the community is eager for it. There's a College Avenue redevelopment community um, hosted at the Chamber of Commerce. In addition to uh, more than a decade worth of uh, documented and memorialized public input calling for uh, redevelopment of, of this street as we move farther north. Um, so I, th I think we've set a precedent here. Um, I think as we move farther north, the development uh, interest increases. I think the allowable uh, intensity in terms of building height and, and allowed uses increases as we go up the street. Um, at, at least that's my sense of things. So I hope we won't uh, delay unnecessarily in looking at the rest of the street because I know that there's even more uh, even more interest in, in redeveloping the rest of it just because of the conditions uh, that are there. So I think tonight's a, a great start, and I hope we can go farther in 2018. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Senator, please call the roll. Petty? Yes. Kenneth? Yes. Hutch? Yes. Latour? Yes. Smith? Yes. Gray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Kenyon? Yes. Oh, thank you. That was a great discussion, by the way. All right. Under new business, number one, a resolution to thank the Walton Family Foundation to authorize Mayor Jordan to accept the Design Excellence Program grant from the Walton Family Foundation in the amount of $1,770,000 to fund the design of an interactive outdoor cultural arts corridor along the Razorback Regional Greenway to authorize the issuance of the of a request for qualifications with the condition that only firms pre-approved by the Walton Family Foundation may respond and to approve a budget adjustment. Peter. Mayor Council, good evening. We're very excited to recommend uh, acceptance of this $1.77 million grant for the Design Excellence uh, Program for the design of Fayetteville's Cultural Arts Corridor uh, from the Walton Family Foundation. As you may be aware, the Walton Family Foundation's Design Excellence Program provides financial support to government organizations, school districts, and nonprofits in Benton and Washington counties for the development of spaces uh, intended for public purposes. Uh, the program provides world-class design and planning expertise for the design of those projects. Uh, the 2017 Design Excellence Program focuses on parks and green spaces out, uh, and outdoor elements specifically. Qualifying projects were required to meet five criteria. They must make a compelling case for how projects increase public access to the space and, and strengthen surrounding neighborhoods. They must include a funding plan for their project. Uh, they must leverage the connected trail network, uh, develop a, uh, excuse me, demonstrate a commitment to sustainability, and embody a spirit of innovation to encourage uh, more visitors to the area. In October, the City of Fayetteville submitted a grant application for the design of a 50-acre interactive cultural arts corridor alongside the Grageback Regional Greenway in downtown Fayetteville. The corridor is anchored by the Fayetteville Public Library and the Fay Jones Natural Area on the south end of the corridor. Uh, and to the north is the Walton Arts Center, the Dixon Street Entertainment District Area, and Theater Squared, which is under construction and also is a Design Excellence Program award winner. Uh, the Razorback Regional Greenway is the connective tissue between all of those elements. The city specifically requested design assistance for improvement of infrastructure and public spaces uh, within 12 acres uh, on that 50 acre, inside that 50 acre area. Um, the design components could include festival spaces, public plazas, outdoor classrooms, streetscapes, green infrastructure, trail improvements, natural spaces, and other outdoor uh, elements. Um, a reminder that this grant is for the design of outdoor elements only and cannot be used for 
the design of public buildings, but can be used to design or allocate space for the footprint of those uh, potential public buildings. Uh, the selected recipients um, of the Walton Family Foundation's Design Excellence Program receive 100% of the design funding for their projects. Uh, Fayetteville's design um, a timeline has been identified over a 24-month time period from December 2017 through December 2019. And um, projects are required to utilize the, uh, a list of design consultants that have been pre-selected by the Walton Family Foundation's Design Excellence Program. And you'll notice that in the uh, resolution, there's a whereas clause that addresses this requirement of the, uh, of the grant. By accepting this grant, the city is committing to funding the implementation of the final approved design by 2021. Um, the Walton Family Foundation is aware that due to the size uh, of the construction uh, cost for this project, the primary funding source for the project would likely be uh, a bond funded, uh, a voter approved bond fund. Uh, other CIP funding has been identified as supplementary funding to aid in the construction of that project but that CIP funding would not be enough to construct the full project. Uh, thus, there's also a whereas clause in the resolution that addresses the need for um, uh, a voter approved bond uh, support to uh, fund the final construction of the project. Uh, in your packet, you'll find the program letter, um, the grant acceptance program letter, our design um, excellence award grant, uh, a map on the final page of the, uh, of the grant uh, program um, shows that 50 acre boundary and then there's a budget adjustment for the 1.77 million dollar acceptance of the grant award. Uh, finally, I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Walton Family Foundation for their generous support on this particular project and the many other projects that they have invested in in the city of Fayetteville. May I want to add a couple of comments to Peter's uh, agenda report. One, I want to thank Peter and his team who worked uh, hard on putting this grant together application for the city to even have this opportunity in front of us. Uh, we think people don't realize that the sustainability and parking division does a lot more than sustainability and parking. They get handed a lot of projects that don't fit anywhere in the city and we really do appreciate their work on this and Lee Folson uh, for his work on writing this as well. Um, I, I do want to make it clear because I think when we went out to do this uh, grant application we were extremely concerned because no one likes to ask someone for money in an area that's sensitive that people have a history of not agreeing on. Um, and so we have a lot of stakeholders with a lot of various interests. We have council members in the redevelopment of the lot, um, in the establishment of corner buildings in our downtown master plan. We have the Walton Arts Center where proximity parking of their patrons is important to them. We have Dixon Street merchants who use um, the south end of this uh, parameter we're talking about for festival activities. We have a, a um, urban trail that connects uh, from our library, uh, Prairie Street actually, all the way uh, to this area. And we have a lot of ownership. This, while it sits in Ward 2, it's owned by everybody. I think we, we hear that a lot. And so uh, one of the key things that we have made clear to all of our stakeholders is for no one to come with a preconceived idea of what must go where, that we actually have the benefit of uh, someone else paying for world-renowned design architects to deal with all of these issues and get us the best opportunity um, possible. And I think that it's exciting in the sense that we've been able uh, to do that. We've also made it clear that when you're talking about a project this size that is um, really life-changing, and it goes back to uh, uh, Mayor Jordan's vision in the state of the city that he wanted to create a uh, downtown and entertainment district that would basically become the Times Square of Northwest Arkansas. Uh, this is a step in that direction. Um, it's a big, bold vision, and it's going to require big, bold funding uh, to make that happen, which means when you talk about future funding of bond issues, uh, we're talking about projects uh, of the size that, that must go in that. And, and the Walton family, we've been clear to articulate uh, will require voter support, which is why we have to get this right uh, for the council and the people who would actually support it in the future uh, if the council chooses to go that direction. Um, but I want you to know, I think, that, and hopefully we'll hear that some of these comments from the public uh, tonight, but we have met with key stakeholders, um, and I believe we have a really good open mind to this project and a chance to really get it right uh, and 
truly have place changing here in our city. Very important. I agree. Um, all right. Any comments, questions from the council on it? John. Mr. Mayor, I'm just, con uh, I'm just thinking out loud. We're spending, uh, I'm very grateful for the contribution from the Walton Flannery Foundation. And they're giving us 1.7 million in design money. What will the projected cost of the project build out be? Do we know that? We've done a very high level uh, preliminary estimate at a construction cost somewhere in the 15 to 20 million dollar range. So we'll be asking our voters to approve bond issues to cover that expense. We will. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. I do want to uh, say for Council Member Latour that the 1.77 million was um, established by using 12 percent and saying if if that was 12 percent, which is normally designed as between 10 and 15, so we took the middle percentage and that's how we got the range that we gave you. We don't really know until we yeah. see a design. Yeah, that's just, yeah. uh, any other questions? All right, what public comment do we have on this? <coughs> Mayor, Council, my name is David Johnson. I live at 1512 North Crestwood. Um, I think we all acknowledge that this city has a rich heritage and visionary development, transformational development. Um, if we think about the downtown square, if we think about the town center, if we think about the Walton Art Center, um, we think about Theater Square, our library, um, a long history of, of development that has truly transformed our downtown district. And when you lay this against those efforts and that vision, um, I think it really stands as an opportunity for us to propel ourselves far into the future in terms of a destination to beat all destinations in not just Northwest Arkansas, but in all of the region. So I um, request that you authorize the mayor um, the ability to accept this grant. Thank you, David. Who else would like to address us on this? Okay, I'm going to bring it back to the council. Matthew. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I couldn't be more thrilled about this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think one of the hardest things for people in an elected position to do is to um, make decisions uh, with um, uh, in, in consideration of what residents who don't live here or maybe aren't even born yet want. Um, even though, you know, there are going to be as many of them as there are residents here today uh, in, in the future. And I think this is one of those rare times where, um, where, where we're able to do that with, with, uh, with a clear vision. Um, a decision to build, th to build something like this is um, it's really hard to overstate what, it, what its impact is. Um, pu public spaces like this um, that, that are in other parts of the world uh, are extremely durable. Um, Central Park will outlast, uh, you know, it, it, it could outlast the United States government itself, just as many of the plazas in Europe, in France, in Italy have outlasted numerous governments and survived um, uh, even revolutions. Um, so when we talk about time scales and, and we talk about making an improvement in the city on the order of centuries, um, that is what we're talking about tonight. And when we talk about costs as a useful benchmark, we have um, uh, we have budgeted or we haven't budgeted, but we have accounted um, the cost of a sports complex on the south end of town at more than twenty million dollars. Um, a sports complex is unlikely to be as durable as this kind of space, or as important um, to our identity as this kind of space. This is the kind of thing that will define not just who we are but who our great-grandchildren in Fayetteville think Fayettevillians are. Um, so I, it, it's really hard to overstate.
overstate this, uh, uh, the impact of this in, in future generations or, or the value of it today. Um, how, how do you measure the value of witnessing something like a proposal? Um, there's not a place to go in Fayetteville today to watch things like that happen. Uh, and this could be that sort of place. Uh, th this is something that could be so core to our identity as to, uh, as to give us the optimism that's required to really reimagine what Fayetteville can be. Um, so I, I, I know that th this kind of uh, fuzzy optimism um, is, you know, it can be a little uh, tiring when you hear it from, from politicians. Um, but th this is something that will be very real for us. Uh, and, and this is something that, that people who we don't even know about yet and who aren't even born yet will appreciate um, forever. It's every bit as big and impactful as something like Mount Kessler or, or maybe even more so. Um, so I, I can't wait to see what the design process looks like. I appreciate so much um, that, that we are uh, advising people to abandon their preconceptions. Um, I, I think there can be absolutely no sacred cows uh, whenever we are designing a space that is a, that is intended to fulfill su such a high purpose. Um, so whatever your preconceived notions are about where buildings should be or how much parking should be there or any other characteristic of that, it's very important and I think we all start from a blank slate and, and, and go to a very high altitude here and start thinking about what, about what this means for us on the scale of centuries. Um, and I, I wish that we could do that so much more often in our decisions because I think it leads to better, more wise decisions. Um, this is a chance that, that we have to do that. And so uh, I hope we can all support this and I hope that we can all continue to support this when the funding proposals come in and those decisions become more and more difficult. We, uh, we need to remember what it is we're trying to create here and not confuse it with something um, that might be uh, more temporary in nature. Okay. Any other comments for council? Well, we need a motion on Matthew. Mayor, I move approval. Mark? Aye. I'll second that. Okay. Any final comments from the council? Council, I would like to say that this was something that we worked on for a long time. Um, and I, I certainly want to thank Peter and his staff, the chief of staff and everybody that worked on this, the Walton Foundation and everybody that worked with us. You know, there's a lot of decisions you have to make. And, and one thing that we, you know, that we do around here, I, I tell folks all the time, I might throw out ten things. If I hit on three, I'm in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But there are certain decisions that you make that if you're going to be the best city and if you're going to be as progressive as we claim to be, you've got to be, you got to have the top schools and the best libraries, you've got to have the best uh, trail systems and sidewalks and, and uh, planning for the future and, and protecting your green spaces. And you've got to mix all that together to, to, to make a totally, totally wonderful place to, to live, work and play and that's not easy. So sometimes you cannot stay basically in the safe zones. You have to go into places as I say, sometimes I have a, a, a sign in my office that says, if you never depart, you never arrive. You have to move, and, and I've said this before, we'll say it again, you have to move in places you've never been before. And if you don't do that, you stay right where you are, and you're stuck, and your city's stuck, and, and this city doesn't get stuck. We keep moving, we keep progressing, and, and I believe we truly live in a wonderful place. And uh, I certainly, uh, our arts, is, is uh, Theater Square and the Walton Art Center expansion and uh, the moving into this arts corridor is, is, is an area that will put us, I believe, truly on the map, not only in the region, but in, not only in the state, but anywhere in the United States. So that's why this kind of project is so important to us and to the city. So with that, Sandra, would you please call the roll? 
Patty? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Bunch? Yes. Couture? Yes. Smith? Yes. Ray? Yes. Marsh? Yes. <laughs> Kenyon? Yes. And thank you all very much. And moving right along, the resolution expressed the City Council's acceptance approval of the Theater Squared Incorporated pledges and financial commitments <coughs> as sufficient to ensure completion of the Theater Squares $31,500,000 theater project and to authorize Mayor Jordan to invest the promised $3.1 million as construction reimbursements pursuant to the contract of June 28, 2017 policy. As you all recall, in March, you approved a budget adjustment and uh, agreed to participate in funding of the uh, Theater Squared uh, new constructed building uh, to the tune of $3.1 million. At that point in time, you authorized the mayor to enter into an agreement with uh, Theater Squared uh, to actually uh, create a contract with them in regard to reimbursement or transfer of the money to participate in that funding. Uh, in that contract uh, that was agreed to by Theater Square and the mayor, uh, there was a provision that before any reimbursement would be made for that money that we would come forward to the uh, City Council to approve uh, a contract for that reimbursement. And one of the issues in there was to ensure that uh, there was financial funding to complete the project at that point in time. As Chief Financial Officer, the uh, Mayor instructed me to look at the finances of this project to ensure that it would be completed. I did so identified uh, that this project, which will run $31.5 million, had uh, sufficient funding to be completed. I personally looked at underlying documentation, see that about $21.3 million had been pledged to the project. In addition to that, our best bank had arranged for a loan of up to $18.5 million for funding to ensure the completion. So based on that, uh, I am recommending that uh, the financing is there to complete the project. Now, the one area or area of concern or risk I need to point out to you is uh, as I looked at the construction contracts, Theater Square does not have a uh, performance bond with the contract manager. Performance bond financially uh, secures the completion of the project. It's normal in a uh, project of this size, the city is legally required if we went into a $31 million project to have a performance bond. However, Theater Square did not feel that the cost of that bond uh, was worth securing it to ensure completion by the contract manager. The, the contract manager is Baldwin & Shell, large organization, good reputation, so therefore you need to evaluate the risk of whether or not the project will be completed. Uh, although this, I would not say, is a significant risk, it is a risk, just like insurance. Uh, you don't need it until something happens. However, our commitment is $3.1 million in this project. Uh, our facilities uh, management director uh, will oversee the work done for which we are reimbursing in this project before the reimbursement is made to Theater Square and we will ensure that we have uh, all the waiver liens, things of that nature, uh, so that is secure. But that is a risk I need to point out uh, to you, uh, the lack of a performance, uh, performance bond. Based on all of it, when I look at the bottom line, however, I would recommend that we enter into this contract and move forward with it, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. What questions do we have for Paul on this? Okay. Um, what discussion do we have from the council on this? Martin, you want to address this on anything? Are you good? Or I just always appreciate the opportunity to stand here and say uh, thank you for your faith and uh, uh, both uh, Theater Squared and also the community that's been very supportive. The campaign's going very well. Construction also going very well. Uh, uh, we had some really cool uh, uh, aerial footage that we just got a few days ago, which we're 
about to share out. Um, but the basement is complete, and over the next few weeks, you're going to see vertical walls rising up from the theater volumes, which I think a lot of people are going to take. I might notice. ask that you silence your silence your phones, please. Go ahead. Um, uh, that's all. We are on uh, budget and on schedule and really excited for what's next. Okay. Any questions for Martin? Mark? Martin, uh, I, I just think it's important that we understand the decision of not going with a performance bond on this uh, larger sure. project, and I, I would like to hear your, your reason and your assurance as we move forward so that we have a record of that. Yes, thank because you. Because we certainly do want a complete building regardless. We feel the same way. Um, yes, I'm joined here, by the way, by our board treasurer, Todd Yeslow, who uh, uh, wanted to be here to reflect that this was a considered uh, decision by the board. It was a recommendation by our board facilities chair um, at the time, Bob Kohler, who had been an owner's rep on a number of projects. And um, it is, a uh, in public projects, a very common, in fact, required, legally required uh, process to ensure a performance and payment bond on a project. Uh, um, it is an option on a private project. In looking at Baldwin and Shell's reputation, uh, their capitalization, which is extremely healthy, um, and, uh, and also the complexity of the project and size of it relative to other projects that they have done, um, our board did not consider it uh, worth the investment of what would have been um, around one hundred and sixty dollars to $180,000 of in part, public funds, um, and so that was the decision that they made, and we relied on it. And uh, we are now six, uh, almost seven months into the 19-month construction uh, schedule, which obviously reduces the risk as well. Um, but uh, it's also a month-to-month -month risk. We pay monthly and, and confirm that the work has been completed, um, so the actual uh, exposure is relatively minimal. I will also note that all the subcontractors have been required to be bonded. Uh, so the only work uh, that does not have a performance bond on it is the Baldwin and Shell's portion on top of those bonds. Thank you. Todd, did you want to add anything? Or? Uh, no, I just want to reiterate that it was a, a decision that was carefully considered by the board, one that uh, we think that so we did our complete due diligence on. We understood that we did have an option whether or not to bond this project or not. We uh, realized that investing the money for a bond would be uh, over cautious. And as the mayor said, uh, sometimes you just have to take a risk in order to get things to move forward. And this was a minor risk that we thought we could assume in order to build this theater for the community. Okay. Any questions for Martin? All right, thank you all. What public comment do we have? Peter Tonneson, Ward 3. Um, preliminarily, I'd like to welcome Mr. Smith to the council. Um, I was here at the last meeting and didn't realize what the crowd was all about because this whole thing blew up so quickly. And I just wanted to point out that I am disappointed that there are apparently only two aldermen voted that there be a special election. I'm a big believer in democracy and in having the taxpayers and the citizens involved in government. And here we had a quarter of the city that was going to be represented for three years, and yet the council decided that it would appoint Mr. Smith. And I have nothing against him. I've, I've known nothing about him. So I'm disappointed. I mean, we had special elections on December 8th of 2014, September 8th of 2015, and August 9th of 2016. They were all paid for by the taxpayers at awkward times, I might add. And yet, when you've got a quarter of the city being represented for three years, they couldn't do a special election. The only thing I would say is that in this time of year that Jesus came into the world unexpectedly, and Peter, we're, we're discussing Theater Square right now. All right. right. Well, I'll get to Theater Square. Yeah, here let, we go let's, then. Let's stay with me. Stay with Theater Square. All right. I was here during that March meeting. I remember Mr. Tennant was the only alderman who asked that there be a business plan, and he seemed concerned about it, although I think in the end he voted for this. And I still want to know why is there no business plan. 
Uh, in the letter of February 15, 2017, Theater Squared said that they had a commitment of $12.5 million. In fact, they had $3.5 million from the Walton Fund, which was for design, and that went away from Northwest Arkansas. That went to Charcoal Blue in London and Marvel Architects in New York.